Good evening and welcome to another Wednesday evening Bible study. I'm Pastor Bell Brown with Carmichael Baptist Church. This is part of our short study series and this is our fourth in this short studies in Galatians. Our first had to do with giving the uh, basic overall view of the book of Galatians and establishing that he is really centering on Christian liberty, uh, but also the purity of the gospel. Um, both of those are essential. In fact, as he begins to introduce in chapter one, uh, the Galatian churches, remember that region that's there, he's arguing for the defense of the gospel because he isolates and identifies what the problem is. You guys are being moved away from the gospel. Um, he's also, of course, asserting his message and calling um, he's arguing for the liberty of the Christian by asserting justification by faith, not through obedience to the law. That's, remember, what some of those Judaizers are coming in and doing. Um, I'm going to break this whole lesson up into three bite-sized pieces for you, and I'll give you those in a little bit. But this is how serious it is. The first thing that he really does, he talks about, is that the idea of taking away that justification of faith destroys the purity of the preaching of the gospel. You can't preach the law and grace at the same time. Not only does it destroy the purity of the preaching of the gospel, but you end up perverting the practice of the gospel. You can't act in accordance with the gospel if you have a different faith than what is really being taught than in the gospel. Well, let's get into this again. Just to remind you, Christian liberty is the theme of the whole book. We're now going to be dealing with justification by faith, which he started with his own personal testimony in chapter one, going all the way through uh, into chapter two. And now we're going to get into chapter three in this particular study. We're going to break it, like I said, into three bite sized pieces and how that Paul argues for justification by faith. He's going to argue from a personal perspective, their personal perspective. What about you? He's going to talk about a scriptural argument as well in dealing with Abraham. And then he's going to deal with a logical argument argument in the latter part of that from verses 15 to 29. So with that stated, let's go ahead and get started with chapter, or the first part of that chapter in verses one through five. And I think that you can pull a whole lot more out of that than just those things that I will share with you. But let's take a look. I forgot, I gotta click the slide and tell it to stop recording. My, my, my. First section of verses one through four it reads, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing or of faith? His argument really does take the form of a relatable narrative. In other words, it's something that they can identify with themselves. It's kind of a an alarming phrase that he uses uh, to disturb them with his utter amazement of their position. And he uses a very strong language, but it's all of this. When you look at that whole phrasing, it's personal, it has to do with them. Their questions both individually and collectively at a church. But if you notice, look at all, every one of those statements is about our question, but they're a rhetorical question. So it's going to be personal. It's going to be rhetorical because you know what the answers are to every one of them. And then lastly, it's confrontational. Oh, foolish Galatians. Again, when you look at all five questions and the confrontation here, I'm just shocked. How can you be this senseless? How can you, and he'll say it later, be so bewitched, so entangled with someone who's taking you away from the truth? Look at all the questions that exist. 
they have this he begins by identifying an act of foolishness i mean who got you to leave christ for moses who got you to leave justification by faith and move to a practice of a religion that teaches righteousness comes by obedience to the law did you forget how you were saved are you so unwise and so guided by the flesh and therefore fleshly? Are you so spiritually ignorant that you have begun to believe that you can finish the redemptive work of God through your own power, through your own flesh? When you were saved from your vile affections and your practice of your heathen religion, people rejected you. People fired you from your job. They turned against you, even family members, because you wouldn't eat with them or practice with them or profess the same thing. You, in other words, suffered for your faith, even in its infancy. And the question is, was all this in vain? Do you just have an empty profession of faith? That's an extraordinarily strong and direct and very confrontational set of questions. How would you accept this sort of rebuke? I mean, this letter was to be read before the churches, and Paul is not only confronting them, but the Judaizers and their false gospel. They were polluting the gospel by teaching a works-based religion. And every one of those answers, you know what they are. Who got you? They, they knew. There were certain who had come down from Jerusalem pretending to have authority from Jerusalem. And they did, in fact, not have that. So everything that he begins to mention in here and how rich it is, it's personal, it's rhetorical, it's confrontational. But one of the other things that's too, you can see it, and I don't want to deal too much because I'll get into this another one. This isn't difficult to understand. This wasn't your original profession of faith, he reminds them. It wasn't there when I baptized you you were very clear that god saved you by his grace you professed that you were very clear about that when you were organized into a new testament church so how did all of a sudden all of this change what happened you had found a common salvation and professed a common grace and mercy from god that had saved all of you i was there paul said i heard your testimonies i baptized you on the basis of your profession of faith he had gathered those baptized professors into local New Testament churches and had begun to instruct them. So it was obvious that someone had come along and moved them away from their original profession of faith. Let's go on to our next section and how he begins to deal with them about their justification by faith. Look, you know the answer. You can understand from your own personal experience you know the questions the rhetorical the answers and what they are but it really does hit you right where you live it's confrontational come on who's duping you uh, you'll see a biblical argument paul in other words is going to go back into the word of god which they were uh, becoming familiar with as heathen as gentiles that's the only scripture they had. They didn't have a New Testament. Paul was writing that. Peter was writing that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were writing that. But the scriptures they had were the Hebrew scriptures. So what does he do? He's been talking about and confirming the truth through the example of Abraham. And he ended verse 5 with a question. And he reminded them of their own personal experience and again, remember how that he had, the spirit had made it real uh, in their personal experience that the gospel of grace became powerful and it became personal as it was preached to them. He also reminded them, remember about the miracles which were confirmed in that gospel of grace or confirming of the gospel of grace by those who preached it. And it wasn't the teaching of the law that made the difference. It was a teaching of the gospel of grace, of justification by faith. And it came to them by the hearing of faith. Look at the verse now. Even as Abraham believed God. Same way. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. 
Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham? And the scripture foreseen that God would justify the heathen, that was those Galatian churches, those people, that he would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Look at that little rich nugget. Here's the gospel. What did he say? In thee shall all the nations be blessed. That's the gospel, you bet. In a little nutshell, the promise contained the fact of the inclusion of Gentiles, that it wasn't going to be restricted to the descendants of physically of Abraham. That's why it says, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Let me read you the rest of the uh, portion here. For as many as are of the works of the law, they're under the curse. For it is written, again, a biblical example, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you fail in one area, you're condemned by that law. But that no man is justified by the law on the side of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. There's no combination of the two. There's no mixing of the two. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written. We've seen that again, biblical argument, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we, meaning all of us, might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, again, this was a personal argument, but it still has to do with their uh, biblical argument. And Paul is basically telling them, open your eyes. Look what the Bible is teaching. And I hate to say this, too, but, you know, the Pharisees made a big deal about their father, Abraham, and that they were the genetic descendants of Abraham. Our father beeth Abraham, right? Yeah, well, what did Christ say about them? No, you're not of Abraham. You're of your father, the devil. That's where your genes come into play. Um, that's pretty shocking. Um, in fact, the gospel, again, was always a part of the message of God for, again, where it says that in thee shall all nations be blessed. This was always a part of God's plan. It was introduced to Abraham long before the law, and it confirms that we are men and women of faith, or if we are men and women of faith, we are going to be blessed right alongside with uh, all of those Old Testament saints, and in particular with Abraham. Now, what you can see in this, of course, like I said, it's a biblical argument. He's going to take it directly from the scriptures. It is written. He's going to use Abraham. He's going to talk about what is going there. In fact, verses 10 and 14 have that. But man, he also talks about that man is never capable or able to keep the law completely or perfectly. And he says that truth is very evident. It's a spiritual truth. But it is a perceptible truth. You can't miss it. It's all right there. The gospel of grace was preached to Abraham, and it didn't have anything to do with the legal descendants of him, but the seed of faith. As in the Galatian churches were reminded, of course, about Paul's testimony, about their own testimony, and now about the biblical testimony that justification is by faith. And that is where we find our Christian liberty. I am freed from the law. I don't have to obey the law. How is that possible? Because Christ has set me free. Abraham didn't have the law. He believed God and it was appointed or it was imputed to him for righteousness. And all of this, he says, is evident. It's clear. You can't miss it at all. So where the obvious is stated, what's happening with these other men? 
Paul's not going to argue from their perspective or take in everything that they're doing. Paul's dealing with the Galatian and the churches, and you all know this. You've seen it. It's perceptible. It's clear. It's right there in the Bible. Let's keep going. Section here from verses 15 through 29. I'm going to give you 15 through 18 and then 19 through 29. And I apologize if the uh, screen makes the verse a little bit small for you to read. Hopefully you have your Bible out anyway, because that keeps it right in front of you. But Paul has been establishing his argument through his own personal change. I mean, think about it. No one was more adamant in following the law and pushing the law, even to the point of uh, persecuting those who taught otherwise, and he had followed the law completely. No one's better suited to present the law if that were the case that man could be justified. But he's telling them, God's changed me. God saved me. God justified me by faith. No more law. It can't be. So Paul, prior to his conversion, presented the law, but now he's changed and he's been commissioned by God. And he shows himself to the other apostles and they confirm his divine mission and his mandate of the preaching of the gospel of grace. The Galatians' own personal testimony and their experience in grace confirms justification by faith, as does then the fact of the story of Abraham. To be true children of Abraham, you must believe like Abraham and have the faith of Abraham. Now let's get into this part. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, meaning he's going to give the sense and understanding that everyone has about a covenant. There's no dispute. This is common knowledge. I could say everyone knows this is a fact about contracts and covenants. Here's what he says. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. In other words, no one else can come in and change that. No other contract can change what was the previous contract. So that's why he says, now to Abram and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one. Now, just to give you a little bit, Paul has to believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures. In other words, word for word, inspiration and preservation. If he didn't, he wouldn't put such an emphasis on whether one word is singular or plural. I, I, you know, all the arguments that people have about, well, the Bible could have been changed. Look, God is big enough to preserve it exactly as he wrote it, as he moved upon men. That's why Paul is making this point. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds. In other words, the Jews are always proclaiming, you know, we be Abraham's children. That's fine. But that was not to the promise that has to do here. That had to do with an inheritance of the land, but not of the promise that we see of the seed of Christ. He says, and to thy seed, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ, the Redeemer. And this I say, that the covenant which that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, it's not relatable. You can make a contract. You can make a covenant 430 years. It's not the same. It cannot disannul that earlier contract, that it should make the promises of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Let me keep reading, but let's make this really clear. These are two covenants, two contracts. One comes 430 years after the first one. And like everyone understands, a later contract cannot annul the first contract. It doesn't change it. Beside the fact that not some other party can invade. The first contract was between God and Abraham and had to do with the seed of Abraham, which is Christ. The second covenant had to do or was between God and Israel. And it has nothing to do with Abraham. They are different. People ought to learn a little bit 
about the different covenants and contracts and the logical argument that you can see. Let me keep reading this. Now, here's where it gets a little bit smaller in print, but he says, wherefore then serveth the law? In other words, why? Why do we have it? If it isn't for the reason that these guys are saying that it was for to be justified, that we ought to follow it, and that's what their argument's going to be. He tells them it was added because of transgressions. It was added because of sin. It was added to make sure that you knew that it exposed the reality of sin in every man. Why is that? Because you know you can't keep the law. You can't keep it completely. Let's keep reading so I don't get lost in this. Anyway, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of none, of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. It's not who will obey, but those who believe. And of course, belief really is an obedient also act, but it's not your obedience that's rewarded of faith because that faith is a gift. Don't want to get lost. Keep on going. He says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law. Talking about Jews now. We were shut up under faith, which should afterwards be revealed. It wasn't fully revealed to us, except it was spiritually revealed. Wherefore the law, what was it then? Why was the law again? What does it serve? It serves as our schoolmaster, our teacher to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. You begin to understand that you can't save yourself, that there's nothing that you can do that is going to make you more holy or pure or acceptable or justified before God. You see that you constantly are bringing back sacrifices. You can't change anything. And you know that by the blood of bulls and goats, God is not completely appeased. If he was, you wouldn't have to keep on coming because of your sin. Remember, you're a manufacturer of sin. It's not just the acts that you have to worry about, but the performance-based, you produce it. It comes out of you. Now, let's keep going for again. For after that is faith come, we're no longer a schoolmaster. For you're all children of God, how? By faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized or literally to be immersed, that's not talking about the act of baptism, but the act of Christ that you are put into Christ. How does that happen? By God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, through the work and person of Jesus Christ. You are put into Jesus Christ and therefore you have put on Christ. In that way, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then guess what? Then are ye Abraham's seed, and then you are heirs according to the promise. To me, it ought to be easy to see that he's using a logical argument. That's what we talked about in this whole third section. He's being very logical about understanding how a covenant functions and how you understand how a covenant functions. One covenant that's made 430 years after this other covenant's been made, two parties that are over here are not the same two parties, and these do not have any effect upon this one. Well, then what was it for? It was to bring us to Christ. It was a teacher. He's using logic to present the fact of the justification by faith. These guys have to twist logic. They have to twist the scripture. They have to twist the personal experiences that you have had. So it's not only a logical, but I love it. It's a grammatical also uh, argument. He argues from the very grammar, not seeds as of many, but seed. Pay attention to the grammar. It's like other scriptures. People will take certain words and attach meanings to them. Um, kind of like 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where it talks about uh, uh, observing the Lord's Supper unworthily. And people will say, oh, you know, yes, you, you're, you, you have to be worthy that night. And so you need to make sure that you're right. It doesn't say worthy. 
it says unworthily. This is talking not about who you are, but how you take it. Grammatical argument is powerful when you begin to look at the scriptures. So he begins to give them a logical argument. It's a grammatical argument. And of course, it's an educational argument. The education is this. All the divisions that are in man and that men constantly make to divide us up, they're gone. They disappear. In fact, there is no more what he calls Jew or Gentile. There's no bond or free. There's no slaves and masters. There's no male or even female. The justification by faith and the imputation of Christ's righteousness breaks all those barriers. Paul said it in a different way in the book of Ephesians. He says it broke down the middle wall of partition between us. It makes us all one. This is why in Jesus Christ, there is no skin color. There is no economical division. There is no uh, uh, division because of biological division. So there's no economical division. There's no biological division. There's just no even genetical division between men. We all go back to Adam. We all go back to Noah and his family. So you know what? We're all part of the same human race. We all need to be saved. We all have the same problem. And so when we begin to see Paul's argument here, it's very logical that he lays out. The law was given again to expose sin to man in such a way that it would ultimately lead him to Christ. And that promise ends up removing the barriers that men make between themselves. We are heirs according to God's promise. And who was that promise? That promise was with Abraham, but it was really between God and Christ. It was the promise of a seed. And that, that seed, he said, was the part of the gospel where he says, all nations shall be blessed. There it is, the gospel is for everybody. It's not just for the Jew. It's not just for the free. It's not just for the downtrodden. It's for both male and female because all of those divisions are temporary. All of them are physical. All of them are man-made and God wipes them out in Jesus Christ. Justification, it comes by faith and it gives us liberty. We're no longer bound to obey the law to have to try and be approved by God and no one can force us to begin to obey the law, to acquire any righteousness or any standing with God or any standing within a New Testament church. My works do not gain righteousness. They display the righteousness that God has already given to me. Glorify the Lord by your good works indeed. But what do they do? How do they glorify it? Because God has changed you. God has made you a new creature. I got to quit with that. We can go on. There are a ton of goodies in these chapters. Look at it. We come back to the same kind of argument next week while we look at chapter four. Lord bless you in your study and Lord bless us in these short studies in the book of Galatians. We'll see you next time.